estén bien en, en, en sus casas uh, o donde se encuentran. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning for some of you, uh, wherever you are. Welcome to this uh, virtual seminar. Uh, thank you for joining this series of Simit Brownback seminars. I hope you're all doing well. These are very difficult times, but challenging times, but also times that will create new opportunities. So as of today, we will continue in the format of virtual seminars or webinars to the current unprecedented situation. So as per the invitation stated, you have been provided details via Zoom. I do want to ask everybody to, to write your questions in the chat so that they can be uh, read out uh, to uh, Eduardo at the end and being answered. Questions can be in Spanish uh, or English. My, your microphone is muted and this is a standard practice and we appreciate uh, all uh, participants to remain muted during this presentation to avoid any background noise. Now I want to present you Eduardo Tobar and he will present us agroecosystems and resil what or resilience in the time of COVID-19. Eduardo, Eduardo was born and raised in Mexico City where he studied food chemistry and gained experience in the fields of food science, human nutrition, and R&D. He volunteered for different initiatives, such as the food waste strategies, urban agriculture, and pursued later on an MSc in organic agriculture and agroecology at the famous and infamous University of Wageningen, and became experienced and interested in sustainable food systems and food security. Eduardo has also been involved in analysis, design and assessment of farming systems, as well as development of methodologies and protocols for monitoring and evaluation. When he has some spare time, he enjoys swimming, practicing slackline, dancing, cooking and reading. So uh, that for sure are all skills to be very resilient. So very interested in hearing what you have to share with us, Eduardo, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends on when, uh, where you are. Uh, buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches. So uh, first of all, I decided to, to make this presentation in English because I thought uh, it's easier for people that speak Spanish to understand English than for people that speak English to understand Spanish. So that's, that's why it's in English. And anyway, it's nice to, to practice for all of us. Why not? Um, so this presentation is entitled Agroecosystems and Resilient What, or in Spanish uh, Agroecosistemas y Resilique, uh, or Resilience in Times of COVID-19. Uh, my name is Eduardo Tobar López. I am part of the team of the Hub Peninsula de Yucatán. And uh, so I decided to make this presentation, first of all, because we are in the, in the middle of the COVID-19 situation. And second, resilience, uh, because I think it's a more commonly used words nowadays, word. And so it, it, it just intrigues me because uh, many people are using it, but I'm not really sure whether we all know the, 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 the definition or we use it in, in the proper way. So that's why I came up with this presentation. So. So uh, this is quickly the, the agenda for this presentation. I will start uh, talking about resilience and systems properties, resilience in agroecosystems, then uh, the COVID-19 impact and action, uh, action that is taking, uh, then a, a quick checkpoint, and then I will continue with some of our the, the, the field work we are doing in the peninsula of Yucatan, success and failure stories from the field. Then what's beyond the, the lockdown or the quarantine, and in the end, uh, participation with uh, Q&A. No? So uh, to start, well, I think you all know that resilience is, uh, is a word that it's been used over the last years, uh, more and more every time. Uh, so maybe when you finish this presentation, for the people that don't know exactly what resilience means, so you will probably go to Google and type resilience. So I did already that. And this is what, what, what you can hear in, uh, see here in the presentation. So resilience, according to Google, 
and Google is based on the Oxford University Press. You can see in the, in the slide the source. Uh, so the first thing you, you see when you type resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or uh, toughness, a degree of toughness, or the ability of a substance or object to spring back into a shape or a certain degree of uh, elasticity, right? Um, uh, all other definitions that I have found uh, is that it's a measure of how much you want something and how much you are willing and able to overcome obstacles in order to get it. Uh, it's also the ability to mentally or emotionally cope with a crisis or to return to a pre-crisis status uh, quickly. These are like overall definitions of uh, resilience. But speaking about system resilience, is the ability of a system to withstand a major disruption within acceptable degradation parameters and to recover within an acceptable time, right? So all these definitions uh, just got me thinking and I identified two components that the, the word resilience have. And as you can see, uh, so going back to a certain status, that's one of the components of resilience. And the other one is uh, time. Many of them, as you can see, they speak about uh, time. So it's going back to, to uh, a pre-crisis status and also within a certain period of time, right? So those two components are part of the, of, uh, the word resilience. And in this uh, tiny graph you can see here, so resilience uh, has been used since many years ago, but I think I marked those two uh, spots, 1980 and 1995, because those are maybe spots that we can see that the, the, the use of the word resilience, according to Google, it increased a lot, no? So now it's, it's, it's being more and more used every time. So, um, also doing some research, uh, there's, I, I found these uh, studies carried out by Titonel, and this one is from 2015. And in, in this study where he, he talks about different systems, systems properties and systems dynamics, he, he came up with this. Uh, so he divides the properties of a system in, 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 two, in two categories. One, the first one is when uh, when the variables affecting or influencing assist, uh, the properties are internal and the other one is external. So internal properties or internal vari variables and external variables. The ones, uh, the system properties in relation to a system's own structure and functioning, which are the internal, are divided into uh, productivity, diversity, and stability. Yeah? Uh, and the other ones, the, the ones affected by an external variable, in this case, in, the, in this context, of course, of a, uh, of a crisis such as uh, COVID-19 or any other, you name it, uh, climate change or any, any other. So these are reliability, adaptability, and resilience, which is the, the main in this, in this presentation. Uh, but so these three uh, properties are somehow related and, and to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm still sometimes confused because it's, they are so close sometimes. So I'm still in the, in the learning curve for this. Um, so just to let you know, I don't have the absolute truth in this, but it's, it's, it's a research, it's research that I'm doing and I'm very intrigued by it. And maybe in the end, you can also express your opinion about this or ask anything. But so the first one, uh, reliability. So as you can see in this graph, in, in, in this black line that is, uh, like going up and down, up and down all the time. This is the external variable affecting a system, right? So it's affect, affecting the system over a period of time. And then, then the response of the system, which is uh, the red and the blue lines, uh, this is translated in, into the reliability property, uh, shown in two, two, let's say two ways, no? So when this, there's this variable affecting the system, one response could, could be that the system in a specific parameter you're looking for goes up and down and up and down when it's not very, I mean, speaking about this topic, it's not very re reliable, right? You cannot really trust it because uh, the, effect, the effect of this variable, it just makes that your system goes like this, basically. So this, uh, we're talking about a low reliable uh, system 
And in the opposite, a high reliable system is when, when the target, let's say a target could be the soil organic matter of a, of a plot, of a farm. The soil organic matter could be uh, relatively stable no? over time, which talks about a, re a more reliable system. So this is reliability. We also have adaptability. So adaptability is more about, you can see the, the external variable, which is the black one. Uh, there's external variable over time, and then there's a sudden change in the variable, it goes down, and then it continues. But this is basically uh, meaning that the external variable changed completely no? in, in a different direction. Uh, maybe easier to understand if we talk about, let's say, the local government changed. Uh, this is the external variable. No? It was certain government, then came a, a new one, and there's a different uh, variable now. And how you, does your system respond to that? Uh, so a low adaptable system would be that in the moment of the change, the target you're looking for, in this case, let's uh, talk about maybe yield, yield of a crop, it just goes down, no? So you're losing your yield because of this change in the, in the variable, in the external variable. Uh, on the other hand, a high adaptable system is when uh, this yield would remain stable despite this change in the variable, right? And, and then we have the, um, the resilience, which is if you see the, the external variable, there's a, there are small changes, then there's a big change or a, a, let's say a COVID crisis no? or a climate change, uh, extreme events. And then how does your system respond, uh, respond to that? So a low resilient system would just drops in the, in the target. Let's speak about yield again. So the yield goes down very, very low. And then it just recovers slowly over time. No? You can see it in the graph. And, and the high resilient system just goes down and goes up uh, faster. So I put there with the two arrows, these two components of the resilience that I was telling you before. One is the component of the time. So the low resilience system uh, goes back to the pre-crisis status in a longer time. And the res more resilient system goes back to this uh, status in a shorter period, right? So it goes back to normal uh, faster, basically. And in the end, you can see that both reach the pre-crisis status. In the end, they are both resilient, I think, because they went back to status, but maybe it could be the case that they don't even go back to the same, uh, to maintain this target yield that they wanted. So maybe they are not resilient at all, right? So this is uh, just, to, just to explain this, these three variables that I think they're important, especially the, the, the resilience, and to see how, uh, based on this, uh, properties, how much you can trust your, your system. So taking this into um, agroecosystems, uh, well, we know and we see here, and probably you know more than me, but there's already a lot of uh, research in resilience in agroecosystems. Um, especially most of the research we, we found is related to climate change, adaptation, and uh, mitigation. No? So you can see some here, like agroecosystem resilience and farmers' perception of, of climate change, uh, capturing agroecosystem vulnerability and resilience, etc. There, these are just a few examples. Um, and most of them related to climate change and uh, mitigation and ad adaptation. No? But what about other uh, system disruptions? Let's, uh, let's bring again the, the topic, no? COVID-19. What about in, in these cases? Is there any, any research about this uh, resilience in agroecosystems in, in this other context? So just to show you that there's already a lot of research about resilience is of course not a new word. Uh, but in a, in a nutshell, or in short, in order to have uh, more resilient agroecosystems, according to some basic research I did, in these uh, papers, uh, the following is, is, is uh, needed. So diversi diversification of crops and practices, and knowledge sharing, uh, maybe among farmers, but also probably 
considering or valuing uh, indigenous knowledge and uh, scientific knowledge. Huh? Um, interaction and involvement of different stakeholders. Uh, we will see that also later. Uh, water and soil conservation practices, of course, focus on natural resources. And a very important one that I, I hope I can manage to, 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 make, to give you clarity on what I, what I, I, I mean with this, uh, but focus more on relations rather than elements of a system. So I, this, this one is special, uh, so I will repeat it in the end, but I want you to keep in mind. So focus more on relations rather than elements. Um, so a quick, also a quick, very quick research I did on COVID-19 impacts uh, on agroecosystems and agriculture. You can see many here. I think you have already seen, we have been bombarded by, by this um, everywhere on the, on the internet or even from one person to another one. Um, so we are perceived that, uh, of course, th there is a, cr a crisis and there will be a, a crisis. Uh, and with all these messages, there seems uh, to me that everyone has answers and has solutions and recommendations. Seems like everyone is expert. But sometimes it also seems to me that the recommendations or uh, expertise just goes in different directions. And it's not very clear, no? Seems like everyone is putting their own best solutions. So sometimes it can be uh, a bit confusing, uh, I think. Uh, the good news is that I, <laughs> there's also some or, uh, order or some structure already. So this is a very short timeline to show that we, we started with this uh, spread, spread of information um, uh, moment. No? where uh, media printed digital or news or what is called word of mouth which is basically in spanish called chisme no but everyone just uh, talking to each other about the, the crisis the impact of uh, covid 19 the impact of uh, of this on agroecosystems but it's maybe not really focused on quality of information or precision but it's just information spread around no? everywhere then there, there was a, a second uh, stage of sensitize, sensitize or sensitization, um, sensibilizar or conscientizar people, um, basically organizations such as uh, CIMID, of course, uh, FAO and others, uh, governments, scientists, um, doing this sensitize to their uh, people with more supported uh, data. Right, so it, it's more trustworthy probably. And, and in the end, there have been indeed some recommendations and measures. Last week, there were a couple of also conferences and, and lectures uh, that I had the chance to, to, to see. Um, there, there's also the, um, the Food and Land Use Coalition uh, signed by, by many, many organizations, companies, such as uh, CIMIT, SIAT, uh, among others. So that tells me or, or gives me the impression that there is indeed some action already being taken and in the same direction. No? So people together and in just one uh, direction. Uh, Dr. Villalobos from, from SADER already giving some specific measures uh, last, last week in, a, in, a, in, a, in this conference, um, uh, also together with the, with the Ministry of Agriculture in Argentina and also some uh, webinars or lectures from, from FAO so it seems that it, there's already something on the, in, the, in the same direction. No? So that's more, gives me more trust. Um, so this is a, a first checkpoint um, in which I, I, can, I can summarize that uh, life is unpredictable and SHIT happens. I will not say the word. Um, this is crisis, hurricanes, COVID-19, full army warm. So this is, uh, it's, it, it happens and it will continue to happen. No? We cannot avoid it. But also, and this might sound a bit like a superhero movie, but it's, I think it's true that also with change comes uh, opportunity, opportunities. Uh, there's, there's a chance to, to improve things. Also, resilience is important. Yes, I think so. We should continue working on this. But also maybe some other attributes of systems, such as 
adaptability and reliability, you know, as I explained before. And also seems to me that there's already a lot of research, a lot of answers and recommendations, but in many different directions, but also some actions being taken already in the in same direction, which is, which is good. You know? So this is the first part of the presentation, checkpoint. And then I will get into another topic. This I will I will explain more of what we as a team are doing in the, in the peninsula of Yucatan. Uh, I named this success and failure stories from the field. This because they're success indeed, but of course uh, there has been failure. No, there's no success without failure. And I think sometimes in uh, in, a, in, a, in a from a personal perspective, sometimes I learn more from failure than from success. Um, so that's why I mentioned this. Uh, so as, as, a, as a context, how Peninsula Yucatán uh, is located, of course, in the Peninsula Yucatán, in the three states, in Campeche, Yucatán, and Quintana Roo. Some, uh, uh, some, some data from, the, from this place is that it's mainly a flat uh, area. Um, the average altitude is 50 meters above sea level. Um, and there's a small we can call it mountainous region in the center south of the uh, peninsula between Campeche and Quintana Roo, which can be up to 350 meters above sea level. That's the highest probably point. Uh, the soils are based in limestone. They are young soils. Um, the, 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 the climate, the weather is tropical uh, and summer, and I would even say late summer rains. And we have basically two uh, production systems, no? um, intensive mechanized systems and milpa systems. And probably each of these can have more um, sub sections or subcategories, but it's basically these two. So in the hub uh, peninsula Yucatan, we have a, a, we have a, a, a mission. Uh, this one is based on, or is, is targeted or towards the increase and stabilization of uh, production of crops, uh, the increase of resilience of the systems, and to contribute to food security, right? So in order to achieve this, we have, uh, we have uh, projects, and this is thanks to these investors I, I show on the, on the screen, uh, Secretaria de Agricultura, uh, Walmart Foundation, Gruma, City Banamex, uh, Fomento Social Banamex, and Fundación Haciendas del Mundo Maya. Uh, and thanks to this, we are uh, putting this into action and transforming with these means that, that you can see there that are technological innovation and capacity development, basically. And to land this a bit more uh, specifically, I'm showing you some pictures, a bit more interesting. Um, so together with some farmers and, and researchers, uh, this picture you can see here is in, is in Yucatan, but we have already did some applied research in the fields and found some possible solutions to have more um, resilient systems, farming systems. And some of these practices are this one you can see here. And so this one is, um, well, you can see a, a maize plot. If I don't know if there's someone here that doesn't know much about plants or, or agronomy or agroecology, but these are maize or corn plants. Uh, I think you can see very clearly that from the center to your left, uh, there are these plants that are a bit dark, more uh, darker green, a bit taller, and you can see clearly that from the center to the right, they are a bit short, shorter than the other ones. Um, so this is part of, of our research we did uh, together with the WADI, Universidad Autónoma de Yucatán, uh, Dr. Castillo, and Dr. Nora Honsdorf. We evaluated here some treatments as uh, such as burn and no burn in the field. Uh, also spatial arrangement of maize or corn. Sp spatial, re uh, referred to space, not, uh, not special, but spatial. Um, re uh, regarding the, the space where you put the seeds. So between, so be between plants, one meter of uh, distance, and also between the, the rows of, uh, of the plants, also one meter, and the other treatment, between one meter between uh, these rows of plants and half a meter between, between plants, right? So these are two different treatments. And also 
uh, another treatment, which is the intercrop of maize, bean, and beans and pumpkin, the traditional milpa system, and maize and mukuna, which is uh, another uh, legume. And so to show you some results of this. Um, so this one is uh, arreglo topologico, is the spatial arrangement I was telling you. We've, uh, we've been evaluating this since 2017. And as you can see, uh, 2017, 2018, there was a slight difference you can see in the yield of, of maize. However, it's not uh, statistically uh, different, different. But in 2019, we, we got to see this difference, which is uh, statistically different. And it's higher in the treatment of when you put uh, maize half meter apart from each other, right? So this one is, is, is one, uh, one result, one nice positive result that, that we've, we have found. And we have been also promoting it with other farmers. Some farmers have adopted this, uh, this practice, which helps also to, um, to, to, to not just arrange the space, but also put a certain order. And, and this is just showing that there's a 200 kilograms difference. Uh, it's higher, right, for maize, which is a good thing. We are, we are helping to produce more, which is one of our objectives. Um, another one is uh, one we're doing with, uh, together with uh, Dr. Silvanus Ojo, um, post-harvest management. In this one, we are evaluating, and also together with, with Dr. Castillo from Wadi, uh, in this one, we're evaluating uh, airtight or hermetic storage, such as metal silos and uh, plastic bags, and also what we call alternative solutions. These are lime, uh, lime powder, and also is the one that is used for uh, nixtamal, and, uh, or water or soda uh, bottles, which are just a local resource you can find easily, and also some plastic bags. No? <clears throat> so the airtight or hermetic storage are probably a bit less uh, accessible for farmers sometimes. And alternative solutions, maybe sometimes they are easier to get. And they also have different results. So some results we have found on this are um, the airtight or hermetic storage. As you can see in the pictures, the, these metal silos, in the three pictures you can see one. Um, and also some uh, plastic hermetic bags. They have been found to, to have less than 5% of, of, of damage in the grains. Uh, in comparison to uh, alternative solutions, we have which, which have uh, less than 15% of damage. And the conventional, which is what farmers usually do, which normally here in the peninsula could be uh, just a regular, uh, how do you call that, a, a costal, a big bag, regular, which shows uh, less than 35% of damage. Uh, maybe a bit more clear in this graph. In this plot, you see the red one, which is uh, the, the conventional innovation or technology, which has a considerable damage of, of the grain in the end of, of a certain period of uh, study or research. And the two uh, small, uh, short green ones, right? Which are the metallic silo and the hermetic uh, plastic bag. So this is another technology that has shown, uh, I think, very good results in terms of uh, saving, saving, uh, saving grain, saving food that goes to, to waste that is uh, damaged by many insects. And also in this one, we are promoting through different people, through different practices. And luckily farmers are, are also adopting. We are here also working with the, uh, with the um, supply or promotion of, of technologies because also sometimes uh, the data is there, the research, the results are there, but sometimes um, it needs more and more effort to, to have actually the accessibility for the technology. So we are also working on that. Um, another also, I think, big result, thanks to a lot of people and the, and the team, and especially Dr. Ravi Singh from, the, from our program. Um, legumes and oil crops for ecosystem services, such as uh, food, for humans, uh, feed for animals, nitrogen fixation uh, capacity against soil compaction, um, weed management, beneficial insects, among many others, right? Some of these crops that we are uh, testing in, in the peninsula 
our pigeon pea, in Spanish it's called uh, chicharro gandul, sunflower, uh, monk bean, cow pea, which is a, 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 a local bean, uh, here it's called espelon, uh, sesame, peanut, or fodder peanut. Um, you can see in the, in the pictures on the right side in this long, uh, long image, uh, we can see the, the chicharro gandul or pigeon pea. It's, it's, this one is great against uh, weeds, and you can see other other crops there. No? So these are showing many ecosystem services. One of my first impressions of this was that the first time I, I went to, to to a trial with many of these crops together, uh, the first thing you you realize you realize is that you enter and immediately you see all these uh, twenty different insects flying around, which is not very common in other plots such as when you have just maize. No. So I think that's a first impression that it's very nice to, to know that uh, beneficial insects, fauna, things are happening there. So there are dynamics between the system. Um, so this is also starting to show some results. I, I still don't have results to show you, but look, uh, hopefully in the coming years, uh, next year, next cycle probably, we can show you some, some data. But this is also something we're doing and it's showing already something. Huh? Um, and, and, and this one also, this is uh, um, the network analysis. This is something we have been doing uh, with Dr. Rendon from SISTAM and Carolina Camacho. Um, this well guided by them together with, with the whole team in the peninsula. So this systems analysis maybe is a bit different from, from what we do in the, in the field, in plots. This is not very related to plants maybe, but um, this one is more related to humans. So all these dots you see in, the, in this network are stakeholders or, or people that are just interrelated, right? Like a, like a spider web. So this is another practice or something we're doing that I think is uh, very useful for uh, resilient systems. You can see on the left side in Campeche that um, between 2018 and 2019, there were um, 31 stakeholders uh, in, in, in 2018 and same number in 2019. However, the relations between these stakeholders increased you know, from 25 to 33, which is, is, is a good thing because this impacts in, the, in what you see there called the, uh, density, which is one of the parameters of this network analysis. Density just tells us how many relations among these stakeholders are from the total of relations you can have in this uh, hive, no, or in this spider web. So from the total, the percentage you, you have as re active relations is this percentage I'm showing you there. 2018, there was 2.5%. 2019, there was 3.5. Maybe you think it's small, but I think uh, a small increase is very good because there are many actors. So this basically means that from 2018 to 2019, uh, that the whole network increase the relations. No? People were, were talking and consulting more each other. I think me also talks about a, a more resilient system. More, if we see a spider web, it's more elastic, more a bit stronger. Uh, centralization is another parameter. And this one is more related to how much information is concentrated in just, in just one person or one stakeholder which may be an increase, it's maybe not very nice because if the relation with this actor that concentrates everything breaks, then maybe the system is not working properly, right? So to me, the centralization should be going uh, down. In Yucatan, you can see way more stakeholders. Um, the good thing is that from 2018 to 2019, we increased uh, to 20 stakeholders or people in this network. Uh, in this same relation, the existing of, of relations also increased. However, since the number of, of the stakeholders and their relations increased, like um, in, in the same, uh, how do you say that, the same order, let's say, the density didn't increase, right? But I think it's still a good thing because actors, uh, stakeholders grew and also relations. Uh, centralization in, in Yucatan. Uh, well, the, the input, which is when uh, when uh, somebody, when many people ask to just one person, and the output is the opposite. When one person asks a lot to many people, right? Um, so centralization in Yucatan, I, I think, 
uh, it, it didn't change as much as in campaigns. But uh, just to show you that this is another practice we're doing together with Rendon and, and Dr. Camacho, and it's also very useful for uh, assessing and maybe improving systems for more towards more resilient systems. And uh, those are the four practices or innovations I wanted to show you. Maybe it's very brief, very short, but uh, this is the more the most representative things I, I think I, I could show you. And also related to resilience, and especially talking about resilience in these times of crisis, such as COVID or any other crisis, you name it. But so, what do I think it's beyond the lockdown or the quarantine? Um, what could be useful to improve resilience of agroecosystems? One is uh, to approach uh, the, the approach to different uh, levels of farming systems. Sometimes we focus too much on, on a plot or field level maybe, but what about approaching farm, household, or even community or landscape? And this relates to the way we measure things, right? So if we go back to the first slides, when I showed you the system properties, it really depends where you put your boundaries of your system, right? If you, your system is the field, then you can measure sometimes some, some things, but if your system is the whole landscape, maybe you find more options to measure different things to assess the resilience and to improve it. Uh, another thing is, uh, I will combine the two next, uh, focus on natural resources and on local resources, such as, uh, I mean, natural resources as uh, seeds, uh, ecosystem services, and local resources, more talking about people. So uh, to strengthen the spider web, especially I, we, we see it here in the peninsula now, that a lot of people are, are coming back from Cancun and all these tourist areas back to communities because they have lost their jobs. So there are a lot of people that maybe were actually want, uh, wanted to do something else, but they had to go there to work. So maybe they are coming back and maybe now there are opportunities as for example, entrepreneurs for post-harvest technologies. No? We have one case of, of a person here, of a, a guy that he became a, a blacksmith is producing now the, the, the metal silos. He even went to Asia recently to give a workshop, which I think is amazing. So working more on these uh, local resources. Also, I think indicators is key here. Uh, categorize indicators using the system's properties and include others. For example, just an example, maybe instead of yield, we could measure land equivalent ratio to see what's the, the productivity of uh, intercrop systems. Instead of calories produced, maybe nutritional diversity over time, uh, among many other indicators. And also look into existing, existing frameworks for assessing resilience in agroecosystems, because I think there are already many. In this quick research that I did, I found many. Um, so some solutions are already there. And more important, that's why I highlighted these ones, focus on relation rather than elements. I repeat this again. I hope you get what I, what I mean. Um, and you can see in this image on the, on the left, no? so more relations, you can see in the, in the previous slide actually, more relations that rather than just having elements. Uh, Science-based solutions, I think that's the foundation of what we do. Without science-based solution, we cannot be really uh, recommend, I think. And uh, together and in the same direction, no? such as I, I show you in the first uh, slides. And with this, still there. Um, and so lastly, when I think about resilience, I think about spider webs. And I want to ask you, what comes to your mind when you think about resilience? Uh, and with this, I, I also want to thank uh, the whole team, not the ones I mentioned, but also there are a lot of people behind this. Uh, the, the, the close staff from the hub, uh, Carolina, uh, Vladimir, Eugenio, Suelen, Eileen, Edgar, etc. There are many people uh, back uh, supporting all these, all these results I show you. And uh, thank you very much. I don't know if I used more of the time, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, Hashtag La Agricultura Sigue. And there's some uh, my contact details if you want to contact me. Uh, thank you very much. And I think now it's time for questions or comments. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eduardo. We have one um, first question from Thomas Payne. Uh, he's asking how does resilience relate to the broad adaptation of the wheat varieties that CIMI develops? To, to the what? Sorry? Um, how does resilience relate to the broad adaptation of the wheat varieties that CIMI develops? To the adaptation and of of uh -huh. uh, wheat varieties that Simi develops. Yes. Um, so I think, I mean, uh, no, no, not just wheat, but also maize varieties are being developed. And these, I think these seeds are a component of, of the system. Uh, and the seeds indeed are one component or tool that could make systems more resilient, I think. I, I cannot tell you specifically, specifically about the special characteristics of, of seeds. Uh, since I'm not a, a seed developer, but I, I, I see the, the seeds as just one more component to help the system become more uh, resilient. I don't know if I'm asking, uh, I'm answering actually, but uh, I hope I answered the question. Or, or you can maybe explain more. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a second question from uh, Tania Casalla, and it says, uh, hops as enabling environment actors how does resilience relate with the scaling processes? Take it in, taking into account that the innovation network concept of the hub means also that the external events will affect differently every one of the actors. Okay, so how it relates to scaling? That's a very good question. Um, so with, with resilience, I think scaling up, I think they're very related. I think you cannot really scale up if, uh, if you're resilient, because if uh, there's a system, an innovation network, a hub, uh, a region, and you're scaling up, which to me scaling up uh, tells about, uh, speaks about a whole sustainable system. If you're scaling up, you will always have crises or disruptions coming into your system. And if this system that is scaling is not resilient, then you will go down, you will not progress. So I think in order to do scaling up, you need to have a very resilient system. Otherwise, uh, I think we will see that indeed is maybe not scaling up properly. No? Am I answering correctly or enough? <laughs> well, um... Let's see com more further comments. And there's one more question. This one is in Spanish. Uh, should I'm going to read it in Spanish. Um, en sistemas sí, 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 está bien. Es, eh, from Alberto Chassain. Um, en sistemas agrícolas resilientes y estables en Yucatán y Campeche, eh, Cam Yucatán Campeche, ¿qué porcentaje le asignarías a la selección correcta de las variedades eh, genéticas? Eh, versus el manejo agronómico adecuado de los cultivos. Versus el manejo agronómico de los cultivos. Ok, o sea, teniendo el manejo agronómico, entiendo, y las diferentes variedades o la genética de las semillas, ¿qué porcentaje, qué porcentaje contribuye a la resiliencia? Um, Alberto, if, if, you would, if you would like to, uh, si gustas agregar un poquito más a tu pregunta, sí, dice que sí. Oh, oh, ok, es, eh, bien, gracias por la pregunta. Eh, híjole, es, es difícil asignar un porcentaje eh, definitivamente son parte de este, yo creo que definitivamente sería un, un porcentaje eh, ¿cómo decirlo? No, no, es, no es la mayor parte, ¿no? si tenemos un 100% no sería más del 50 creo yo creo yo que el, este, junto con el manejo eh, Ok, viéndolo como, como semillas y como manejo, pues yo creo que el 50 y 50, ¿no? Pero pensando en, en semillas, por un lado, un manejo acá, un manejo acá, un manejo acá, pues ya es como que se diluye. Pero bueno, pensando en, en la diversidad de semillas, la genética y las prácticas eh, agrícolas, creo que, creo que están muy a la par. Creo que podría ser un 50 y 50. Ok. Um, there is one more question uh, from Surinder. Uh, how to work on a spider web approach on their current quarantine-like situations for post-harvest managements? How to work on a spider web approach? 
I'm not sure if you mean I'm just not sure if you mean the spider web, um, the network analysis I showed, or you mean like a graph of a spider web? Puedes repetir la pregunta, Isabel, por favor? Sí. How to work on a spider web approach under current quarantine like situations for post harvest management? Okay. Um, uh, quarantine situation for post harvest management. Right. So how to work in a spider web approach? Um, so from if I think of in the in this classical spider web uh, plot or graph we usually we we, we use, um, I think we first need to identify the critical points of post harvest management. So let's say climatic or weather um, um, points or, or uh, how to say I lost the word uh, climatic uh, points. Um, uh, plagues, uh, the practices. So you identify the critical points that affect the post-harvest management, um, and then you just assess the, these critical points of where you are in each one, and then you are. Uh, I guess in that way you can identify where you need to improve your post-harvest management practices. This is thinking in a spider web uh, plot, uh, and in, in the in the other way in the network analysis, um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's just what, what we did, but focus on the post-harvest um, management, right? So you, you, you target, you survey or interview all the people around post-harvest management. So the users, the farmers, of course, uh, suppliers or producers of, uh, of post-harvest technologies, also the government. So everyone involved in the whole ecosystem of post-harvest and uh, and then you you trace where where is each individual or each stakeholder and then you trace the relations if there are not too many relations here it means that probably you need to improve your relations there in order to have a more resilient system thank you uh we have to uh as we have participants at live stream we have 22 participants live stream uh, about 83 participants via Zoom. So a very good audience. Thank you to all. Uh, we have two further questions of live stream. Uh, one call from Carolina Camacho. Uh, uh, she would like to listen Eduardo's opinion of the work that we are doing on traditional, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, I lost it. Um, okay, Carolina would like to listen Eduardo's opinion of, of the work that we are doing on traditional knowledge about weather and climate change. Are you considering that they are contributing to the resilience? Mm, that's also a great question. Um, um, so, well, first of all, to be honest, uh, I don't think we're, we're, we're still doing enough to, um, to get the traditional knowledge in uh, climate change. Um, so, I, th I think there are other ways we're looking at, at, at traditional knowledge. Maybe we started looking at, at the milpa system itself, but I think we, we have we have read and and, uh, and 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 we know some some things now about that there is indeed some traditional knowledge about uh, uh, climate change, such as this uh, cloud uh, perspective or cloud shape that one time we were talking about. Uh, so we know there's something, but I think we just haven't uh, included in the in our work yet uh, enough. So yeah, with that, I cannot really say that is contributing, but I'm I'm sure it will contribute in, uh, when we include it in the, in our work. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have another one from um, Arturo Tobar. Uh, what is or should be the key to resilience in corn agriculture during a crisis like the one we are living now? In, in what kind of agriculture? What is, what, is, what is it or should be the key to resilience in corn agriculture during a crisis like the one we are living now? What should, what be, should be the resilience? To resilience in corn agriculture. What should be the resilience in agriculture in crises like this one? In corn, are you referring um, to maize, maize uh, or I, uh, corn agriculture? Uh, 
Okay, thank you. Um, so the resilience in maize or corn agriculture, um, I think a key thing that we're doing now um, here in the peninsula is uh, working a lot in uh, native maize varieties or native maize seeds, since there's indeed a lot of variety. And I think they, they just have um, a lot of the resources we, we need to, um, to have a, a, a resilient corn system. So a, a focus should be on, on native maize or corn seeds, I think. Um, another one could also be what uh, Carolina, Carolina mentioned, so traditional knowledge not just on, on crops and, and nature, but maybe also on uh, climate change, traditional knowledge, maize uh, seeds or varieties. And uh, um, I think also focusing on, on, on soils, going back to this focusing on relations rather than elements. So I think focus, focusing on the relation between crop, soil, um, crop, soil, farmer, nature, um, that's another one, but that's more on a broad scale, not just maize, but in general. Thank you, Dave. We have time for one more question. Uh, here we have from Sanchez, uh, Carla Sanchez, I think. Uh, it is in Spanish. En relación a los problemas sociales que existen en el campo, generacionales, de género y de acceso a la salud, y a lo que sabemos sobre, que esta, sobre esta enfermedad es mayor en personas con un rango de edad de más de 50 años y que se ha identificado una mayor incidencia en hombres que en mujeres. Eh, ¿Se está considerando algún mecanismo para disminuir el impacto en la resiliencia en el campo como, a, como efecto a los posibles efectos en la salud de los productores? O sea, el impacto, estamos hablando de este, de este impacto, esta enfermedad actualmente y la edad de los productores, ¿no? Ok, y, y la pregunta es si, si estamos tomando alguna acción para... Eh, sí, así okay, es, correcto. algún mecanismo para disminuir este impacto. Eh, bueno, creo que in, indirectamente las, algún, las innovaciones que les mostré, entre otras, indirectamente obviamente tienen un, un, un efecto, ¿no? Creo que ayudar a, a, a producir más eh, o, o producir mejor, eh, de forma más sustentable, más productiva, eh, indirectamente afectan porque creo que una mejor eh, nutrición, mayor eh, disponibilidad, disponibilidad de alimentos, eh, impacta en una mejor salud, así que quizás de forma indirecta, de esta forma. Y de forma directa, este, a la salud, creo que uno, una de las cosas que, que hemos trabajado es en eh, investigar, validar, eh, difundir tecnologías que reduzcan el, los, los agroquímicos los agroquímicos en campo. Este, por ejemplo, la, la, la estrategia de los cultivos, eh, diversificación de cultivos que les mostré, está dando buenos resultados en, en términos de que hay buen control de, de malezas, por lo tanto se esperaría que pueda haber una reducción del uso de herbicidas. ¿no? Creo que eso impacta directamente a la salud. Quizás no en relación al COVID, pero sí en relación a la salud. Y al final sabemos que los, los menos afectados a la salud son los que tienen un sistema... Eh, un, una, una salud buena pues sin, sin problemas como eh, cardiovasculares u otros entonces me, me llevaría a pensar que, que, que eso puede, puede impactar de forma positiva ¿no? um, Thank you, we have uh, two comments from Santiago López um, and his, this is related to the previous question, uh, his comment that this crisis might call for adaptation rather than resilience, we will not be back to normal, no? Also, he's adding another, another comment. Uh, Santiago says that another interesting concept is anti fragility, where systems come back stronger after a crisis. Um, then we have another question. I think we still have time. So, do you have experience developing adaptation pathways to climate change, most likely trajectory, considering that future climate change uh, impact scenarios are still very, very heterogeneous? Um, experience in adaptation strategies for climate change. Yes, okay. most likely trajectory, considering that future climate change impact scenarios are still very heterogeneous. Heterogeneous. Okay, sí, heterogeneous. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 
I'm, 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 I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think I have, uh, I have enough experience to answer that or to, to tell you, yes, I have all the experience in the world about climate change adaptation. I think um, what, what, I, what I can tell you from, and from what I show uh, is that um, using the, this, or mixing or using traditional knowledge, as uh, Carolina was mentioning, uh, is important and is is key is a key part of uh, climate change adaptation strategies, and other strategies are um, the ones in the field that I show you. No? Maybe the spatial spatial arrangement, uh, post harvest management. Um, so this is what, what I can tell you about. Uh, to me, the, this this could could be means to as strategies to adapt to, to climate change. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to lie to you. I, I don't want to say more about that. I don't think I have enough you know, experience. And, and regarding the comment of uh, Santiago, thank you very much. I was indeed thinking exactly about that when uh, before in the morning I was, I was uh, kind of rehearsing this presentation and like thinking, you know, every time you see something, you think something different. And, and indeed, I was like, well, that's why I put uh, resilience is important, but also adaptation and, and the other one, uh, reliability. Because indeed, this variable that we, uh, I showed that there's a variable, no, an external variable that affects, and then it just, it just changed and it doesn't go back. So maybe indeed, now we need adaptability or adaptation. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, maybe we can give the microphone to Dr. Bram Gubers for final comments and to close this interesting uh, webinar. Sorry. Oh, uh, I can only say thanks, uh, Eduardo. This was an excellent seminar. I think it shows the need for new thinking, systems thinking, integrated approaches, but it also shows that in that thinking, there's space for everybody. And I think that's what we need now. So I would just invite all the over 100 participants in the seminar, congratulations also for that, Eduardo, um, to just be gentle to each other and there's a space for everybody to jump back to even a better situation after this crisis. Let's be part of that story. Thanks a lot and uh, take care. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Stay well.